Hi. Hi, nice to see you all here. Um, so I hope you all had a great lunch break. Uh, looks like people are still enjoying their lunch break, but it's for, all right, let's get started. Actually, I hope that you like money. Is there anyone who does not like money? Raise your hand. Okay, there's one, one person, one crazy person that does not like money. Uh, I'm going to ask, I'm going to teach you today how to sell more, as well as how to make people, how to make customers trust you more so that you can sell more. That's what my talk is about, uh, persuasive design patterns. We'll look at how design, um, how a, a design that applies psychology can, that uh, drives human to work action and why these uh, design patterns work. This is, a, uh, this is a design done by the Obama campaign team where they A-B tested uh, the normal, the, the control design versus the test. So in control, they have a donation form where all of the step is in one page. So from, from like the donor's name to like credit card information to the call to action is all in one page. And then they tested this with the with a design that sequences all of the donation step into four different tabs. In case you can see, it's over here. So the AP tested it, and they found that the sequence design actually increased the conversion rate by 5%. This is a technique called progressive uh, disclosure. It breaks up the donation a form into several steps, into a sequence process that makes the users think that this does not take that much time because it's one thing at a time. This lower the engagement barrier, it produces a sense of investment, as well as it uh, maintains the focus um, of the user's attention. So this is one of a design pattern that applies psychology. My name is Jenny Shen. I'm an independent UX and product designer that spends a lot of time doing product design as well as uh, designing for the e-commerce industry. I'm a designer on TapTal, which is a a global network of designers, developers, and financial consultants. As well, I'm the Amsterdam chapter founder of Ladies at UX, which is a global nonprofit organization that wants to promote uh, female visibility in the tech industry. And now we are a community over 1,800 members in Amsterdam. Over the last seven, eight years, I work with uh, a lot of clients in various industries, and a lot of them are in the travel industry or in the e-commerce industry. So today we will look at the definition of persuasive design patterns, what, why, and where they apply, as well as the application in e-commerce, in engagement, as well as designing for trust. And finally, we'll talk a little bit about the ethics of persuasive design. So first, if you want to define persuasive design, it's actually not as uncommon as you think. For example, Facebook. The notification color is red for a reason. Red, in color theory, it signals warning, it signals, uh, it grabs attention, it makes the user think it's very important and urgent. So therefore, when you get a notification in red, you're, gonna, you're going to want to check it because you think it might be something important or urgent. As well, in, um, in branding, the choice of serif fonts plus a color plus the spacing actually all apply psychology. Uh, psychology. So serif fonts uh, it signals a sense of luxur uh, luxury. And then putting a bit of space and using all caps, it's very common to uh, provide a luxurious kind of feel. And persuasive design, basically, it draws on users' um, behaviors, desires, and motivation. And you don't have to use it only in e-commerce. It's actually applied in a much, uh, much broader um, applications. For example, you can, just like the Obama example I showed you, you can apply it in political campaigns. You can apply it in social networks or reward programs. As well, persuasive design, it can be used to, uh, in nonprofit organizations and even clubs and communities. If you want to persuade people or motivate people to donate to a good cause, or for example, promote healthy habits, or contribute to diversity and inclusion efforts, persuasive design will actually help you do that. So probably most of you are here um, to learn about how persuasive design can be applied in e-commerce. So I'm going to walk you through a few uh, examples and patterns. 
The first one is loss aversion. It says, the fear of losing motivates human more than, uh, uh, more than gaining something of equal value. So according to the value function of prospect theory, if, the, if somebody gains 100 euros and uh, the same person loses 100 euros, the, f uh, the feeling of losing that 100 euros is going to feel more painful uh, in comparison with the joy of gaining 100 euros. So losing will actually feel like, a, uh, like you lost more than 100 euros. And loss aversion is applied um, in products such as Snapchat and Instagram, where the disappearing stories, you have to watch it within 24 hours. Otherwise, it's gone forever and you cannot see it again. It's also used in limited time discounts or prompting the user, hey, your card will be clear if you don't take an action now. So it's making the users think that, OK, in order for me to lose the self in my car or in order for me to not lose this discount, I must take an action right now. So if you want to apply loss aversion, you should frame the gains and losses so that you are framing it that um, where one option is more desirable, which is, of course, taking the action and not losing whatever they have. And to apply, you can use limited time discounts, uh, trial periods, or lazy registration. When you uh, offer lazy registration or trial period, you can offer either a, s a chunk of your product or service that's without registration, and after continued use, they must register to not lose the effort, or that after the trial period, they will have to sign up or pay for the product if they don't want to lose all of the progress they previously had. And you should absolutely highlight what is the thing that is lost by leaving your product or service. Next, we look at endowment effect. It's also similar to loss aversion. It's related, but not quite. This, this means the humans, we place a greater value on object if we have invested in emotional value. And for example, Amazon has a lot of features which allows a user to engage with the platform and really build out their profile, like wish lists, ratings, recommendations, uh, lists, uh, award badges, and so on. And because of these features, now when somebody, uh, when the user is going to shop online, they will prefer uh, buying on Amazon because there's all this list and all this uh, information that they've, they've already built. Up. I already have my wish list here. Like, why would I, why would I shop elsewhere? So actually, it makes a user place higher value on buying on Amazon versus their competitor. And that's what the Amazon uh, user profile looks like with a lot of recommendations, ratings, uh, wish lists, like number of reviews, and so on. And Airbnb also has a wish list feature where people can just be bookmarking their dream homes. So the next time they're going on a vacation, they're going to look at their wish list, and it helps them directly go through the booking flow because these, these lists and these items are already there. And then you can also use it in the cancellation page. For example, LinkedIn highlights, you will lose all your data store, you will lose all your messages, all your contact, um, all the messages you had while you were in premium if you cancel your subscription. OkCupid, okay, it highlights that everything will be deleted from your contact to your messages to your photos, all gone. Are you sure you want to cancel, the delete your account? So here it also offers um, alt alternative, which means disable, where the user has uh, a different a second option, if they actually feel like, okay, I don't want to lose this, then I will rather it disable instead of delete. An endowment effect is used if you want to retain your users. And it allows, you allows your user to place more value in your product or service compared to a competitor. To apply endowment effect, you should allow the users to build a profile with like uh, wish list, ratings, recommendation, just like, um, just like Amazon. And as well, you should highlight what is the invested effort that will be lost if the user cancels uh, your, your service. Next pattern, scarcity. That this one probably uh, many people are already familiar with. 
humans we place uh, scarce object more desirable and more valuable. It's pretty much used everywhere. For example, like three percent of listings left, or three seats left at this price, or three shoes left by now. All of this uses uh, scarcity in terms of stock scarcity. But you can actually apply scarcity in other ways, such as merchandise uh, type of scarcity. Japan does it really well with a lot of limited edition, uh, regional, region, uh, region specific kind of product, and I'm actually, I'm actually one of a person that fall for it. So they have like Kyushu only Kit Kat flavor, seasonal only strawberry drinks, and they have like an entire big page just for limited edition product. It makes the users think that, wow, like I'm in Kyushu, I have to buy this because I cannot get this elsewhere. Or like, this is fall only, but you will not come back the next fall, so therefore I better try it now, otherwise I will never have the chance again. And you can also use uh, restricted access, such as Patreon. It hides the content from non-VIP members. So only people who pay, who, who support the uh, artists, can actually see the restricted content. But it makes people curious, makes people think like, what is actually hidden behind a lock icon? Like maybe they will just donate $5, $10 in order to find out, like what is this VIPO about? Or early access. You can sign up, uh, become a beta, beta tester to test a product before it's released to the public. And if they see, wow, I have this special access uh, before the public, then it makes people want to be a part of it even more because of scarcity. So scarcity encourages per, uh, purchasing or other behavior. It works because it's a, it's a shortcut of human thinking. Like we use an avail uh, items availability to determine the quality and value of something. Scarcity, pr scarcity principle is a shortcut for us to make decisions as well. It works the most when it's created by social demand. We actually want it the most when we are in competition for it. If we say that only 100 people can be beta testers, then people are going to fight for that 100 spot, even if they didn't want us that much um, in the beginning. So several ways you can apply scarcity. You can apply time-based scarcity, like limited time discounts, or uh, coupons with expiry dates, or holiday sales. Or you can apply stock scarcity, uh, by highlighting what is the quantity that's remaining, or by highlighting the fact that there are only limited quantity available. And you can use restricted access, just like Patreon, with paywalls or member-only content. Next, let's look at persuasive design to engage. So remember previously I said, Amazon uses uh, this user profile to allow users to build wish lists from recommendations and ratings for the user to place uh, greater value. But what if you created that and then nobody's writing or filling anything? That's what um, designing for engagement is all about. And not only, uh, not only it helps in e-commerce, it also helps if you run social networks like Zing, or if you need user input for better uh, recommendation algorithms, you definitely need a user's input for, um, for that. So I'm going to talk about hook model just a little bit. Uh, has anyone heard of the hook model here? OK, about like two people in the audience. So this is a, um, this is, this is a model designed uh, or kind of introduced by uh, someone called Nair Ail, and he is one of the experts in behavior design as well as designing um, to hook the users. So hook model is an experience designed to connect the user's problem to the solution. And it looks like this. Hook model starts with a trigger. It can be external or internal. So for example, they get a notification or they get um, a physical mail, or it's an internal trigger where they really want to do something. And then it goes to the action phase where, where user takes an action. After user takes such action, they now receive a variable reward. And then because of the variable, variable reward, they now want to invest uh, even more. And then after, afterwards, they get another trigger, and it goes through the loop where um, 
a lot of products that are so addictive to use, like Reddit or Instagram, Snapchat, they all have some sort of the hook model components to it. So I won't be talking about it too much, but I will touch on the variable reward a little bit in today's talk. So designed for engagement, the first pattern is completion. This one is about providing a well-defined goal uh, so that user will feel to, to give the user a sense of closure. Because as humans, we have a natural tendency to avoid doubt and uncertainty. And because we have a need for closure, it actually drives us towards a well-defined goal. For example, social networks like Google Plus or LinkedIn, it, the ultimate goal is so that you have a complete profile. By listing out the, the steps in between empty profile and complete profile, then now the user knows they need, there's five steps from the name to education to interest, jobs, whatever. Now they complete one, two, three, four, five, and now they have a complete profile. Or Google Plus uses uh, percentage as well as the progress bar to tell the user, hey, you're 25% to your profile. Do you want to get to 100%? So to apply completion, you should provide a user a uh, tangible end goal. In LinkedIn and Google Plus case, that's a complete profile with number uh, one, two, three, four, five steps all completed. And you should set expectations and communicate their progress, such as uh, the time left to complete, or the number of steps, or the percentage of progress. As well, if you are interested to gamify your product or service, uh, this is, this is a something called gamification, where you can actually provide uh, tangible or intangible rewards um, with the pattern called achievement by giving user points or badges or levels or certification. In gamification, uh, like Foursquare actually is really, really good at it. It provides a lot of badges, provides a lot of gamed uh, elements to motivate a user to keep on exploring, finding new badges, leveling up. And when I worked at Gimme, a, a white level loyalty platform, we designed a lot of gamification elements. We also helped the publisher in Malaysia called Hungry Goware to implement this badge system. So Hungry Goware is kind of like Yelp, is a food review, restaurant review platform. And the more users uh, review different type of restaurant, the different badges they get, and then they can level up by, by reviewing more of the restaurant in that category. So if you want to gamify your product and service, consider using points, levels, badges, or give out tangible rewards. And the var variable reward that's mentioned in the hook model, this is about giving user um, a sense of scarcity and unpredictability because it, it really steers the user's curiosity to try to discover um, the reward, try to discover the pattern. Compared to fixed rewards, actually variable rewards produce the highest activity in users. That's because we humans we react differently to certain kind of patterns. And studies actually show that if you give users the rewards at an unfixed interval and an unfixed amount, it's actually more effective than giving it every week or every month or at any fixed schedule and amount. For example, one of my favorite games, Mirror Card, there's this thing called Mystery Box. Has anyone played that before? Oh, quite a few people. So I love this Mystery Boxes because when you're, when you're racing and, and then these are like the Mystery Box in front of you and you don't know what is inside, Sometimes you get something great. Sometimes you get something shitty. <laughs> so because of that, you're actually even more curious. Like, I wonder, what do I get this time? Like, do I get something really nice, a really great power up, or do I get like a piece of poo fouling me, right? So the same way you can apply variable rewards in your uh, e-commerce or your product service. We offer the store opening special with mystery boxes, mystery gift boxes too. Uh, when we launched the um, ro reward program for a physical retailer. So the user can pick one of the nine gifts and then they will get something random. As well, some sites offer like a lucky spin where you get different sort of discount and the user does not know whether it's 10% or 30%.
So to apply variable rewards, you should give out the rewards at a variable in, uh, ratio and interval, uh, interval. Give it at an expected time and random time. So for example, Vmu allows uh, like two gigabyte upload per month. And just randomly, some users who have been uploading the past month, they will get a random upload bonus of like 500 megabyte. So it incentivizes the users to keep uploading because they're curious when they're going to get the 500 megabyte bonus again. As well, you can use uh, secret badges or gift for the community or lucky wheels to give out variable rewards. Next, I want to talk about designing for trust, which is really important in onboarding as well as user acquisition. Only if users trust you, then they will buy from you. And then when they have a nice experience, then they will, they will come back again. But, if, but in the very beginning, you need to make the users trust you. And the patterns that can achieve that, one of them is authority. Because we humans have a strong tendency to comply with authority figures. We have this tendency to trust authority. We see information from recognized authority as a shortcut for deciding how to react. A lot of the patterns I discussed before is really just how our brain works. Because we humans are making a lot of decisions, but decision takes brain energy. So brain doesn't like to waste energy. So brain is going to look for a shortcut, like they are going to look at the, the item scarcity. They are going to look at authority in order for the brain to make quick decisions. So people trust authorities. And we often believe that the taste and the actions of authority will suit us. If we look up to someone, whatever the person does or uses, we are going to believe that it's more likely to be suitable for me, too. However, humans, we are vulnerable to the appearance of authority, even if there's no real authority. By that, I mean, if somebody who looks like a police is dressed up like a police, attitude like a police, and asks for your ID, Normal people, or most of the people, would not question, are you really a police? Well, then show me your ID. <laughs> they would not question authority, because if the appearance is like authority, then they will probably just show the ID as the police requested. So authority, how to apply it? It's applied in many ways. For example, you can use rewards, uh, sorry, awards, as well as linking your product or you linking your platform with really well-known coveted brands. Or you can use a famous spokesperson that fits really well with your brand um, to advertise. Or you can use a lot of award, bad, uh, award um, stickers, just like this wine, which is the most awarded wine in 2017, and it's from Australia. And I mean, when people look at the wine packaging, they see that it has like 10 award stickers. And most people don't even research who, this, who, is, uh, who gave out the uh, awards. Like, who are the judges? What are the criteria? Like, is it actually legit? Like, many people actually do not even question it. They see the appearance of having a wine bottle with 10 different stickers, and then they just want to know, well, I want to know what is the most awarded wine taste like. So that actually, uh, the authority leads the user to believe that it's actually a good product. To apply authority, you can use certification, awards, as well as logos or names of well-known comp well companies. And you should associate your product or service with authorities in your industry. For example, if you are in fashion, then maybe you want to invite a well-known fashion blogger to talk about or try out your product. If you sell activewear, then you might want to invite athletes to also try a product or advertise it or, or talk about it or use it. If you sell cookware or food, then you want to invite well-known chefs uh, to actually try your product or even use it in their shows. So try to be associate your product or service with such authority. Next, social proof is also a really, really common, uh, well-known persuasive design pattern. So why it works? Because humans, we have a common tendency to adapt uh, opinions and follow the majority. Because we want to feel safer. We don't want to, um, we don't want to have conflict by being different. So uh, 
social proof, it means we believe acting uh, in accordance with the society, with the majority, is a shortcut to good behavior. If others do it, then I would be all right if I do exactly the same. And most of us are would rather imitate than initiate. So we would rather copy what other people are doing instead of be the first person to do something different. And again, this is one of the shortcutting uh, thought process um, by our brain because thinking and making a decision requires brain energy. And therefore, it's much easier to copy what somebody else already did compared to thinking about is actually a good action. And in e-commerce e application, you can see a lot of reviews. You can see like number of reviews, uh, ratings, or showing customers like you who bought this, they also bought other stuff. It's to show the user who bought a razor how other people bought all these things, so it might actually sue the person too. Or it shows how the newsletter has 30,000 people, or it shows like 20,000 people are using such product. It's really to show that, hey, you're not alone in the decision. There's 20,000 people who made the decision, who made the decision, so therefore, feel safer, join them. To apply social proof, you should use numbers from facts or statistics. For example, 14 reviews, uh, 100 people liked it, there's like 1,000 subscribers, I had had 200 plus clients. It really shows that like these numbers really add up and to build, um, to build authority. And it assures users that they are not alone in a decision. Just like what I mentioned before, uh, you can tell your users, others like you also bought this, or others like you also viewed this. And definitely you try to use more testimonials and ratings uh, for social proof. Finally, uh, I'd like to talk a bit more about ethics. The question I want to explore was, is persuasive uh, tactics dark patterns? Is persuasive design ethical? Raise your hand if you think, yes, it's ethical. I think about actually 70%. Who think it's not ethical? OK, about, about yeah, like, like 20%. So there's, there's actually a mix of people um, who who, who think it's ethical, who think it's not ethical. I will tell you my, my take later. Why am I talking about this? It's because uh, this, is, this is not the only talk that you see on persuasive design or conversion optimization. There's a lot of resources and webinars and, and workshops to teach you how to persuade users to, to try to sell more. However, a lot of people, a lot of companies are taking it too much in a way that um, it's becoming dark patterns. And I want to talk about it because I don't want any companies or individuals to think that they can apply all kinds of persuasive tactics or, um, or these patterns without, and, and to the extreme without consequences. So there is a scale of honest UI and dark patterns. And the UX or UI designer's role is to, it's really like, not pick a side, but really determine like where your design is at. So to the, to the scale of honest UI, the designer designs for the user's needs in mind. The user's needs are prioritized, even at the expense of a company's low sales or conversion rate gains. For example, if the, okay, we, for, for an honest UI designer, it would be like, oh, newsletters are too spammy. That's not sent any newsletters at all because we do not want to spam any users. That user do not want to hear about any sales. They only buy when they want to. So that's kind of leaning towards honest UI where we prioritize users' need, but the company might be suffering from those sales. But on the other hand, the dark patterns means that the designer pick lean towards the company's interest. So some businesses are being deceptive to users carefully without violating the law. And some actually violate a lot when they do dark patterns, for example, related to like privacy or, um, or any other reasons. So designers have to pick their battle. And then you can look at the whole backlash by, um, that's on persuasive design patterns or so-called dark patterns. Like this article appeared 
on the next web, how Booking.com uses stress to rush decisions. Or like how EasyJet applied the same tactic as Booking.com to, to rush the user to book a flight because, wow, there's 100 people looking at the flight. And old bike, you probably cannot see it very well, but the user, this person, he was trying to cancel his account uh, because he wanted to get a refund. And then what happened is that, are you sure you want a refund? Why don't you sign up? Uh, why don't you upgrade to a VIP instead? So he was very pissed off. <laughs> and then in the, inter uh, in the interface, the confirmed cancel was like, you can barely see it. It's like the lightest gray uh, somebody can ever use. So he was really pissed off. So he, he posted this on LinkedIn. He get like hundreds or even thousands of likes and shares and lots of comments about like, yeah, like I, the other day I was on this company's website and uh, they did exactly the same thing. So there's a lot of backlash from users um, because of these dark patterns. Or like Tina, how she experienced Cora sending automat automated invites to all her friends just because she signed up, but she did not grant a permission. Or like how Facebook, it was trying to prompt the user to get access to their personal contact, but guess what? The only option here is OK. And then only if you click on Learn More, then you can change your settings. That's kind of what not a user expect. Or this app just blinks in the browser, like, hey, come back. Hey, we need your attention. And somebody's complaining how that should be illegal. So why do people think these are all dark patterns? Like they use time-based scarcity. Um, they are trying to lead a user away from canceling and upgrading. So they are leading a user toward doing something for the company interest. Or they are get, trying to get a user's attention in the browser. And the reason why people uh, are resistant or upset about the patterns and think these are dark is because these designs violate this usability principle by Jacob Nielsen. It's user control and freedom is one of the 10 usability heuristics for user interface design. For example, the user didn't feel like they have a choice but to book the flight because 100 people are now looking at the flight. Or they didn't have a choice to not give away their personal contact. They didn't have a choice to not send invite to like thousands of their friends. They didn't think they have any choice. And the, then the user who complained about Opike, he didn't think he was given a choice to cancel because all he see was like upgrade to VIP. So when you violate this usability principle, users are going to have less trust in your company. So persuasive design tactics. Now, as you, as, you, um, as you realize in the room, like 70-30% seven, uh, split of people think it's ethical or unethical. That's because everybody's skill of ethics is different. And persuasive design is subjective. That means, for example, scarcity or authority is not going to work on every person. Like some people think that, well, you can ask Angelina Jolie to be the spokesperson, but like, I don't think it, it's persuasive. Like it didn't it didn't motivate me, motivate me to buy this perfume. Like, it's going to apply differently on, on, on different people. But what users really hate is when companies manipulate us to do things that we later regret. And that's why a lot of people are having this backlash against uh, persuasive design patterns. So my take on is persuasive design ethical? My take is that it's not unethical unless one intentionally deceives the user, for example, like lied about the awards, lie about something, or pretend that there's limited quantity available where there actually wasn't, or it takes away the user's freedom to do something against the company interest. So that's my take on the ethics of persuasive design. And it really depends on how you apply it. Because you can do a lot of things in a way that's more effective. For example, persuasive design patterns make selling, more, make design more effective because it achieves goals, it achieves conversion optimization. But in the same way, you can speak to an audience, like what I'm doing now, in a way that's more effective by telling stories, by interacting with the audience, by telling a personal story. 
or you can like network in a way that's more effective. You can sell in a way that's more effective, but it does not mean that it's unethical. So therefore, that's why I think persuasive design is ethical. But just don't lie about, <laughs> just don't lie about your product, or don't make fake testimonials. So I want to end the talk with a cheat sheet. If you have been taking pictures or notes, uh, this cheat sheet will just give you a summary of all of the patterns that I have mentioned before. Feel free to take a picture of it. And as well, uh, I'm on Twitter um, at Jenny Shen, and as well, I'll, I'll show you my email later where you can email me or tweet me with any questions. If you want to see more example, I'm really happy to chat. I'm going to hang, uh, hang around the conference. So just wait till people take their pictures. Right, so this is my contact information. I'm on Twitter, at Jenny Shen. Uh, you can go to my website, and this is my email, jenny at jennyshen.com. So feel free to take a picture and reach out. Thanks. <laughs> so I think we are going to have a Q&A session. We have about like 10 minutes. Does anyone in the audience have questions? Sorry? It's hard. Thank you. Or maybe if there's no question, you can talk about is there any like uh, struggles or difficulties in, in applying these in your designs or teaching your designer how to apply psychology. Or maybe it's just like you can chat about like journal op conversion optimization. No? No questions. That's actually the, oh, there, there, there is a one question. Um, can we pass a microphone or something? Uh, I think on this, that, that, that person. Thank you. Uh, yeah, there it is. It is. Okay, uh, regarding this, like 100 people are booking this flight right now uh, thing. Isn't it all fake? Like, is this legal at all? Like, I don't know. Um, I think it's barely real, is it? I'm not saying that it's fake, but um, what do you mean that it's fake? I mean, like, uh, as a the perception? The pattern works. Sorry? The pattern, the, sorry to interrupt you. Uh, the pattern works, obviously. But um, is there any legal uh, restrictment to this? Like, do they have to prove that these numbers are actually true? That there are actually 50 people looking at this? That's an interesting question. Is there anything legal about like you have to prove? Uh, as far as I know, but I don't know about German laws, but as, I, as far as I know, like no. But the thing is, if users discover, for example, like if you say there's one pink high heel shoes left, and a user actually bought it. I'm like, I'm so excited. There's only one left. I got the last one. And then tomorrow, like, they saw the friend. I'm like, did you know I got this, like, last, um, la last night I got this, like, awesome pink shoes. I'm like, which one? Oh, it's exactly the same one. But how can there two people get it when there's only one left? It's like, I think some companies will, will try to uh, use this pattern, even if it's not one left. But yeah, to answer your question, I don't think it's legally required that you prove it. However, if the users, they suspect that the, the number is not true, or if they find out it's not true, then the trust for your company really goes down. Yeah, that's totally true for like what you have in stock. Uh, yeah. Sticking to the flight um, example, you cannot really prove No, you cannot, yeah. But the thing is, like, the, the person is complaining because they, they just don't like being rushed. But like I said, persuasive persuasion is different per, per person. Like some people are gonna like when I see 30 people looking at it, it doesn't make a, the difference to me if there's 300 people looking at it or not. But to some people, like five people looking at it, then they're like super stressed out. So it's really about the user's perception. But you you can never know that in events. I'm not saying like don't put that. But if you put it to an extreme, then it can lead some people to be uh, suspecting or not trust the company. Okay, thanks. I think I might have seen another question from the front rows. 
Any other questions? Oh, there's one. Um, what kind of uh, what sources did you use to um, get all this knowledge, and uh, which um, which sources you used to learn all this, and uh -huh. what can you recommend if I want to read further into it? Yeah, uh, I studied in Interaction Design University, so a lot of the materials come from the university lectures and also reading Nielsen Norman. Uh, so the the ten one of the slide user control and freedom comes from the Nielsen, Jacob Nielsen's 10 usability principles. So nngroup.com is a really good resource. As well, a lot of the, there, there's one, one website that covers a lot of the persuasive design uh, principles. That's ui-patterns.com, I believe. So if you search like UI patterns, I think the person's name is Ender or something like that. And then the website has a lot of these uh, information. As well, I believe there's uh, several books. I cannot recall the titles now about persuasive design. Thank you. Maybe you can later tweet them. Yeah, sure, of course. Thank you. Thank you for the question. One last question. Going once, going twice. All right, looks like we have no more questions. Thanks.